My name is Carden, and today I'm going to be teaching you guys a little bit about coral anatomy and the special relationship that coral has with a marine algae called zooxanthellae. So for starters, where are we? We are in the beautiful Tropical Diver Gallery, and behind me you can see our Indo-Pacific reef wall. It's teeming with life and beautiful coral reef fish and lots of different coral organisms. So coral comes in a myriad of different colors and forms and actually provides a very important habitat for a lot of animal species in the ocean. Coral reefs can only be found in about 1% of the ocean floor, but they support over 25% of all life in the ocean. So it's a very critical habitat. And as you can see, a lot of the fish that we have in here really enjoy being around it. It's gonna provide shelter, a safe place to grow up, and a nice place for a lot of fish to be able to raise their young. Uh, so behind me in the Indo-Pacific habitat, we've got over 164,000 gallons of artificial seawater, and we've got a mostly live coral background as well. Since we first opened our doors, we've been adding more and more live coral, and as you can see, it's grown over the years. But what really is coral? Is it an animal? Is it a plant? It looks a lot like a rock or a plant maybe. They don't really seem to be doing much, but they are very important, and they are actually considered animals. And usually when we talk about coral, we refer to a whole colony of corals, which are gonna be built up of many different coral polyps. So you can have hundreds, maybe even thousands of coral polyps all together as one colony. Um, and that outer colony, the skeleton is going to be composed of a material called calcium carbonate. And each of the little dots or holes that you see, or even what makes some of the corals appear rough, those are the individual polyps that you see. So hundreds or thousands of these little pockets. This right here is a little paper mache model of what one of those coral polyps looks like close up. And I'm here, or it's here with me to demonstrate uh, what those individual coral polyps look like. So a coral is not able to produce its own food the way most plants can using photosynthesis, but it does have these nice little tentacle arms, kind of similar to a jelly or an anemone that it can bring outside of its little protected area that we call a calcix and pull them back inside whenever it feels threatened. So these arms stick out into the water column, collecting food, little bits of plankton that are then able to be brought inside the rest of the parent coral. As you can see, there are a lot of different colors behind me as well. Coral comes in many different colors as well as different shapes. Uh, but where does that beautiful coral color come from? Well, it actually comes from a very special relationship that the coral has with a special type of marine algae called zooxanthellae. Now, I like to think of coral colonies as kind of like apartment complexes. And if each of those little calcix cups that have the polyps living inside are the individual apartments, that coral polyp actually has a roommate and that roommate's name is zooxanthellae. We say it sounds like frozen jelly to help you remember how to say that. So zooxanthellae, frozen jelly. So these are little microscopic or too small to see with the plain eye. Um, that live inside of the tissues of those coral polyp hands, and they're able to bring them inside that coral polyp cup, and they work together in a symbiotic relationship. But what is a symbiotic relationship? There are a couple of different types. The one that corals have with zooxanthellae is actually called mutualism. So both the coral and the zooxanthellae are going to benefit from that relationship. The zooxanthellae is gonna have a place to live within the arms of the coral polyp when they're brought inside and they're going to undergo photosynthesis the way most plants can. They're gonna take that energy from the sun and convert it into energy that they can use and store as food or energy. And the coral is actually able to harness a little bit of that energy as well and use it to help build up that strong calcium carbonate skeleton and also produce oxygen and help the coral remove waste. So what are some of the ways that Georgia Aquarium cares for corals here? Um, in our tropical diver gallery, you can see a lot of these have been growing and have been on this reef wall for many years, but we do have some other areas upstairs. We have our aquaculture labs. We have other grow out areas where we're able to grow small fragments of coral, turn them into bigger pieces and either have them here for our guests to enjoy and learn from, or we're actually working with several partner organizations that are working to support some of the coral reefs that are out in the ocean. Uh, one of those partners that we're really proud to work with is the Coral Restoration Foundation that's based in the Florida Keys. 
So unfortunately, there are several threats out there for coral reefs. Um, not only do they grow very slowly and it takes a long time to build up into those beautiful reefs you might have seen in nature footage out in the ocean or in this reef wall behind me, but there are a lot of stressors that are out there in the ocean today that are making it harder and harder for corals to grow. Whenever a coral polyp gets stressed by some kind of environmental influence, it can actually end up expelling the zooxanthellae that lives within its tissues. And when this happens, the coral is gonna lose all of its color. And this is a condition that we call coral bleaching. Coral bleaching is not always going to be a permanent condition. It can be reversed if the zooxanthellae are reintroduced into the coral polyps. But if it is a permanent condition, then it is irreversible and it can be impossible for those corals to recover. Uh, so some of the environmental stressors that can cause that to occur are sea surface temperature changes, any kind of changes to the carbon dioxide levels inside the ocean, or even suspended amounts of sediment that can settle on the coral and actually choke out some of the oxygen that's dissolved in the water around it. So what are some ways that we can help corals? Uh, you can actually do several of them on your own without the need of any research. You just need to be aware and educate yourself the next time you're out visiting the ocean and you're going snorkeling or scuba diving or even swimming in any of the shallow areas. You wanna be really mindful of any of the coral that might be around you. Coral is very fragile. Those calcium carbonate skeletons do break very easily. So you wanna be mindful not to step on any of them, grab hold of any of them, or even if you're out sailing, you wanna be mindful of where you drop your anchor and you wanna to try to use mooring lines when possible. Another really easy way you can help protect corals is the next time you're out in the ocean to make sure that you're putting on reef safe sunscreen. There are lots of different brands that you can research on your own to go find but the, a lot of sunscreens actually contain harmful chemicals for a lot of marine life. So if you look for that reef safe sunscreen, you're already making a really huge step towards protecting the marine environment. And then obviously another great way to help corals is to continue to support conservation organizations like Georgia Aquarium or Coral Restoration Foundation and help those corals that are out in the ocean today.